Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today, we are going to hear about the book Women, Church and State by Matilda Jocelyn Gage, discussed by Dorothea Anderson. We were hoping to have Sue Gittins, but she's um, unwell today and can't come. So fantastically, Dorothea will, um, will tell us about the book herself. So thank you so much, Dorothea. Mm -hmm. And over to you. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, I hopefully I'll do the bits that Sue was going to do justice. Um, but anyway, we will we will try our best. Joe, do you want to put the first slide up, please? Which just shows the you know it gives a the cover of the book and um, a picture of uh, Matilda. As you can see, she lived uh, quite a long life in the 19th century, and she published this book towards the end of her life in 1893. Um, and it really was the sort of um, culmination of a lifetime's study into the situation of women um, sort of across history and, and in different countries of the world. Now, you might be wondering why we're going back to a, a book that's, you know, sort of nearly 130 years old and why it's relevant. And if we just move on to the next slide. One of the reasons is that um, writers such as Mary Daly have recognised how important she, she is. Daly called her a major radical feminist theoretician and historian. Um, and she was very angry, as you can see here, that this knowledge written with, you know, erudition and passion had been buried, that she didn't know about it. Um, until she did then find out about it and was able to include insights within gynaecology, which is where this quote is from. Um, but she's saying we've been kept in ignorance of our own tradition. Um, and she worries that, you know, even as the, the second wave were publishing books, was this going to happen in the future? And I think we can see some of this happening. I think that, you know, the, the contribution of the second wave and radical feminists and the, the ongoing, you know, current contribution isn't always... Uh, acknowledged as it should be and that's why this series of, of webinars is so important. Um, so I wanted to set Daly within a sort of you know within radical feminist to show you know to show how she does um, fit in. So can we have the next slide please? Which is just setting out some of these sources that we used in addition to the actual book, and also how it fits into a number of other books that have been the subject of radical feminist perspectives over the the, the years. Um, and you know, if you're interested in any of this, you can go back and find out more about it. So, um, gynaecology, um, you know, because it, it certainly the um, chapter on witchcraft draws on on this. Women of Ideas from Dale Spender, which is a, an excellent history of the um, development of feminist thought over time. And we borrowed, um, we drew on that for the biographical information I'll share in a minute. Um, Assisted in Spirit, which is about the um, learning of early feminists, including Gage, from um, Native American women. Um, books on sort of early, early times, matriarchy and, and the development of patriarchy. Um, for a more modern take on um, religion and how it's impacted women, we have Sheila Jeffrey's Man's Dominion, which you know covers some of the same stuff but brings it more up to date. And the Spinster and Her Enemies, which is about you know other radical feminists at this time. So <clears throat> she does fit into very much into a tradition um, of thought and and action. So just a little bit about her. She. As well as a feminist, she was um, an abolitionist. Her house was a stop on the Underground Railroad for escaped slaves. She was a defender of Native American rights adopted into the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation. And she was active in women's rights from the age of 26 and the rest of her life. She was the most radical of the suffrage leaders, but not remembered as much as, as um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, even though she worked alongside them for many years. She was sidelined and written out of history which often happens to women that the most radical and challenging um, because sometimes other women are scared of that. It's too great a challenge to the patriarchy. Um, there were actually two American suffrage organizations. There was the National, which was led by Gage, Stanton and Anthony, which had a radical women's rights agenda and an American organization, um, which was Christian in leadership 
an outlook and was just interested in the vote as a, as a way to get legislation that would support Christian morality. Um, a merger was pushed through uh, between those two organisations um, against Gage's um, wishes. She, she thought it would be disastrous. And she ended up leaving um, and, and to establish a new organisation, which was seen, it was just attacked by Stanton and Anthony as a secession from the, the wider women's movement. And of course, what happened was the history, as so often, is written by the victors. And it was written by those who supported the merger. And Gage's contribution wasn't really acknowledged. She was isolated and erased. So she is very much the, you know, the well, or was and, until um, the, the second wave feminists uh, re rediscovered her, um, was sort of forgotten about. But she was part of a radical um, sort of movement of women's rights that were raising all the issues that the second wave um, raised that were seen then as new, you know, thing, things like sexual exploitation of women, um, violence within within marriage, um, all those sorts of things, but it was it was erased. So if we can have the next uh, slide, please. The aim of the book is very much to show how Christianity uh, in league with governments um, has been damaging for women. You know, she sees it as directly responsible um, for, for men, much of the oppression of women. And so she it's an analysis of patriarchy from prehistory through to the 19th century showing how men and their institutions have systematically oppressed and exploited women. Um, so she gives examples from uh, ancient Egypt through to her contemporary time, and the examples are drawn from many European countries, not, not just the USA. And I, I think she may have been the first um, feminist to actually name the system of, of oppression as patriarchy. She calls it the patriarchate but I mean she's talking about this you know the same um, system where men's institutions are um, are used to oppress women um, and she was also one of the first to suggest that there was something prior to the patriarchy that actually maybe women haven't always been oppressed and that Christianity um, was actually a backward step for women it was presented as sort of the highest form of, of civilization the you know the best um, ever um, which it says here, her position had high, been higher than any before. And she, her aim in this book, which I think she achieves, is, is to refute that. She explicitly li links Christian theology to the leg legitimation um, of the exploitation of women and the way that men as a class profit from women's uh, reproductive and physical labour. Um, and that the harder the woman works, the less she gains. Um, so I'm not going to go into the chapter about the, the matriarchy um, because it, is, it has been, some of those issues have been covered by, by more modern um, feminists in, in other radical feminist perspectives. And there's a lot of other um, stuff to go through. So if we go on to slide number five, which should be the next one. That is the her summary of how the church um, you know, and she goes back to the development of the, the early church during the, um, the Roman Empire and then does a lot about how it developed in the um, Middle Ages um, and what was what was happening and how it, a system of oppression was institutionalized. But the basic issue that was a, the, you know, that the church used against women is that they are evil and are in league with the devil. So that obviously justified anything you do against them. Um, the, the church laws um, that were anti-woman were then built the basis of the development of civil law, the law of states and nations as, as, they, be, as they developed. She realised that although Christianity claimed to be, um, you know, have, have sort of good morals and, um, you know, that priests were required to be um, celibate, uh, actually, that was just a cover for a huge um, sort of system of what she calls organised debauchery, you know, sexual exploitation of women and children, um, but it was actually like justified by uh, the church. 
the requirement of confession, which meant that women were supposed to tell all their all their doings, all their even their thoughts, never mind what they'd actually done to priests. Women were forbidden to read the Bible, so were reliant on what men told them about it. Uh, the sale of indulgences were basically sort of get out of jail free cards that would wipe away some of your sins, so you could do bad things and get away with it. Um, heresy, you know, sort of deviation from true religion was very broadly defined and severely punished. And that, along with the establishment of the Inquisition um, to root out um, heretics, was the basis then of the persecution of the witches, um, which she devotes a chapter to that I'll, I'll go on um, later. So can we have the, the next slide? Um, it's really interesting that, that she identifies celibacy you know, the idea that priests should not have any sexual relationships with women as one of the key um, foundations of um, church oppression of women. Um, although it was supposed to be about, you know, keeping priests pure, away from se sexual temptation and the sinfulness of women, she says that priests were celibate only in name. And in practice, they continued to use women and girls sexually, but the women and any children they, they bore were not entitled to any support. They, they were illegitimate, i.e. illegal, um, stigmatised, um, which kept wealth of the church within the, the hands of men. And of course, we know that um, the sexual abuse um, of children uh, within the church is carried on again to the present day, um, not just in Christianity, in, in I'm sure in all religions, and it's continued to be covered up. So she's very much aware of the double standard of morality, where a man can essentially do what he wants and you know use and abuse women as he wills, and it's women that are seen as responsible for this. Women are the ones that are punished. Women are the the, the ones that have to support the children um, that result from that without any any sort of um, thing happening to the man. So that's the organised system of debauchery. And then just general sort of prohibitions against women, restrictions on their behaviour. Um, women weren't allowed to approach the altar. There was rules on what they could wear. They weren't allowed to speak um, in church. And that Latin bit at the, the end of the, the slide is, you know, as you can probably guess, it's, it's really, you know, referring to menstruation, the idea that um, women that are menstruating are, are impure or dirty in some way and therefore not fit to take part in the, the church service. So it's basically linking into the idea that women don't really have a soul, that we're not really human, which I think is what's playing out in um, a lot of the current attack on women's rights, um, that we're just not seen as real people with real existence and real rights. We can just have them um, sort of trampled over. Um, and the silencing of women's voices, which again, you know, we saw a you know absolute classic example of um, yesterday in, in New Zealand, um, and and also having um, imitation women, um, you know, they wouldn't have women singing in church, so they would either have boys pre puberty to to give the high voices. Or actually having having eunuchs, you know, there was a whole tradition of actually castrating men so that they could um, carry on singing the high notes. And of course, the priests wear dresses. Um, you know, so they get rid of the real women and have and have imitation women. Uh, but one of the things she does point out that, that there are glimmers of hope. Um, and you know, what's this um, question? Because the religious system of um, you know convents and abbeys did allow some women to get power, um, you know, to, to sort of be quite autonomous in running um, an organisation of, you know, a house of women um, with women. Um, and some of them even were, were mixed sex, but with the um, female in charge. Um, and we hear of women like Hildegard of Bingen, who was very um, sort of learned um, and creative woman. And, but there are other ones as, as well. Um, can we have the next one, please? Next slide. So it's just a, 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 a sort of summary here of, of um, how the church and the state combined to keep women inferior. It, you know, the women were inferior and therefore they were subordinated. Um, sons uh, inherited property before daughters and that kept all the money and property and wealth in the hands of men. 
uh, which helped keep women in, in a subordinate condition. One of her key um, insights is that it's lack of education and lack of property that have kept women down, um, kept them powerless. And their lack of that is not an accident, it is a deliberate, um, you know, sort of decision by, by men um, within, within the church and, and the state. Uh, and kind of the, the next one, please. Right. Right. She calls that she then has a chapter that she calls Marquette, um, which is a word that uh, isn't well known today. But essentially, the chapter is all about sexual exploitation and abuse of women and children. Um, the actual Marquette refers to the feudal period in Europe when lords basically had total control over the serfs, yeah, both men and women, um, but the women had a particularly raw deal because not only did they have to do the, the hard labour in, in the fields and, and agriculture, they were also subject to um, sexual abuse. The Lord had the, the right to have, you know, to rape women as, as he, he would, you know, there would be no comeback because she was totally powerless. And that even um, extended to a, a, an idea that on a woman, you know, the night that a woman was marrying, she should actually be taken by the Lord, you know, the Lord of the manor, the, the Duke, the, you know, whatever, um, first, you know, before the man she was actually marrying. Um, and she she identifies that this kind of exploitation of by powerful men against women carries on into her own time. Um, and she she basically accuses aristocratic and royal men of her own time of involvement in child sexual exploitation. Of course, we know that goes on um, now. You know, we've, we've had Epstein, um, you know, the, the involvement of Prince Andrew in that. And I'm sure many, many, many other men that we, we don't know about. And then she brings that up to date by saying that this has been the foundation of all um, sexual ex exploitation of women. It's just a continuous um, tradition. Um, and she recognises that this is the basis or one of the basis of male control in, of women. So she, she says, the woman of every Christian land fears to meet a man in a secluded place by day or night, which is still what we have to reckon. You know, we don't feel that we can freely go where we want to, when we want to. We are aware that we're we are at risk. And then... Men escape all punishment because men alone enact the laws, which is obviously why they were vote, fighting for the vote. Um, but we know that getting the vote enough alone isn't enough, uh, that men are still in charge. The, the laws, they may have improved since her time. Um, some, some of the things that we have laws against raping marriage, for instance, that didn't um, exist in her time. But they're not really very well enforced. Um, please don't take rape seriously, etc. And so it's the, the result of a system of teaching which declares woman um, a being which was divinely created for the use and sensual gratification of men. Um, you know, she's, she's very direct. Sometimes her language can be a little um, unclear because she doesn't actually name things like child sex, sexual exploitation or rape. It's, it's more elusive. But then sometimes she just comes out and says something really direct like that um you know the, the the church sees women as just there for men to use sexually which is very blunt um and she links that to as I said to prostitution in her own time um that still carries on the state is involved in it um she refers to the um, feminist campaign in britain against the contagious diseases act um which was used against women who were um, suspected of, of being involved in prostitution with nothing done against the men. Um, and she actually identifies that the growth of women's ability to work and earn a living um, actually meant that fewer women <clears throat> were sort of forced in, into prostitution. And so there was more forcible trafficking. Um, she gives the example, <coughs> excuse me, Of, of women in the USA at her time who were kidnapped to be taken to remote rural um, lumber camps and, and mines for sexual abuse and subject to extreme violence. So if we go on to the next slide, this is related to her chapter on witchcraft. 
which is it's very it's very interesting. It is a feminist analysis of the um, witch persecutions, um, which Mary Daly described as learned and revolutionary. And she sees very clearly that the persecution of women as witches is part of the church attempt to control and punish women. And although previous um, pagan religions believed in witchcraft, Christianity was unique in seeing the women as the most susceptible. Because women were seen as weak and inherently sinful, um, they were more vulnerable to temptation. And the, the church witch hunters had a saying that there's one wizard to 10,000 witches. So they went out, you know, deliberately looking for women um, as, as the, the evil, the, the ones in league with the devil. And she does see, Gage, it's very clear that the hunting and burning of witches is primarily an attack on women as women. She says, well, witches read women. Um, and she links it to the um, possession of knowledge by women. So women um, having knowledge, for instance, of herbs that could be used, um, you know, for healing the sick, but also um, to control um, reproduction, you know, as either con contraceptions or um, uh, to help abortion. Um, she see you know she, like daily she likes to excavate the the meanings of, of words and show um that some of the meanings have been distorted over time so a vast amount of evidence exists to show that the word witch formerly signified a woman of superior knowledge and few women dared to be wise after thousands of their sex had been done to death by drowning or burning because of their knowledge and she sees the witch persecution as part of an attack upon science at the hands of the church. She's very critical of the church. It's actually been anti-science, anti-education, um, wanting to um, keep deliberately keep um, all people, but particularly women, ignorant um, on the on the basis that knowledge is is power. And she says she gives very detailed historical accounts of the the persecution, torture. Um, an execution of, of million, you know, possibly millions of, of women, and she doesn't shy away from the um, the, the details of it, the use of, of torture, um, and so the the procedures were just complete sort of catch twenty two. So a woman might be uh, tied up and thrown in a river. If she drowned, it proved she was innocent. If she survived, it was proof that she'd used witchcraft and so she would be taken off and burnt at the stake. So whatever happened, you were you were done for. Um, once she'd had that accusation of, of witchcraft had been made, it was you know almost impossible to, to escape from it. Even things like looking, you know, whether or not you looked at somebody in the face was seen as indication of, of guilt at witchcraft. But she points out the church had taught women to keep a downcast look because of their sh they should be ashamed of bringing sin into the world. Um, and uh, to this day, an open and confident look upon a woman's face is deprecated as evil. Um, and so there were traveling uh, witch inquisitors journeying from country to country in search of victims of torture and death, who were regarded with more fear than famine or pestilence. Um, but the witch hunts were also a means to enrich the church because the woman who was um, damned as a, a witch the proper, her property, yeah, any property she had and her family um, would be seized. Um, she sees it, she recognises that older women were particularly vulnerable um, and suggests that maybe um, accusing somebody of being a witch was a, a way to get rid of an unwanted um, wife, you know, a man that wanted to sort of uh, get another woman because he, he didn't like the one that uh, he had or that she was no longer of sexual interest or use to him and we need to remember that this isn't just of historically um interest i mean in some countries such as ghana and india women can still be accused of witchcraft leading to their you know murder um at worst at best ostracization from families and communities and of course we know that the um idea of a of a, of a witch hunt of targeting a woman accusing her unfairly uh, persecuting her is used against feminists that speak up um, you know, J.K. Rowling and, and others, and, and, you know, some less famous women have been punished by lo losing their jobs, um, that sort of thing. 
Um, so she says the persecution of the witchcraft period was but a continuation of church policy that of universal domination over the lives, the property and the thoughts of mankind. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Uh, this, after this, she note that chapter, she goes on to talking about her own time, the late 19th century. Still, he, she still um, puts historical information into it, but this is very much moving into the more into the current position of uh, women in the 19th century to show how little had changed in what was supposedly more enlightened times that um, sexual abuse and exploitation through, through work, through marriage, um, the oppression of women by men continues. Um, that there was actually not as much change as uh, many in the church like to con like to claim. So she's very critical of Christian marriage. Um, the, the teaching of the church was that Christian marriage was better than uh, what had gone previously, and she challenges that. She, she sort of talks about what was going on in Roman times and um, sort of ancient Hindu laws, um, things like that, that gave women more rights of property. So she's very clear that under the Christian form of marriage, a wife surrenders her person, her property and her conscience into the control of her husband. And this is justified by the Bible um, that sees woman as being made for man, secondary to man, under his authority, and that that is justified by God. So any woman that challenges that is actually challenging the divine command of the Almighty. Um, and she's very clear that women are treated as property within marriage. So, quote here, that a, a wife was taken from her own family and transferred to her husband as a piece of property. She assumed his name the same as a slave took that of the new master. Uh, and she also refers to how um, daughters were seen uh, by men, you know, particularly rich and powerful men, as a way of um, you know, getting more property. So you'd marry your daughter off to somebody that had some advantage, you know, advantage, advantage to your family, um, be that a political influence or more property or, or whatever. And, um, you know, throughout most of the time, women had very little, or certainly women of the middle and upper classes had very little say in uh, who they would marry and and so she, she so, you know sums it up the condition of women during 1800 years of christianity legislated for as slaves you know that they didn't have any rights of, of their own imprisoned for crimes that if committed by a man were only punished by branding buried alive for other crimes that men could atone for by the payment of a fine denied a share in the government of the family or the church their very sex deemed a curse. It says, the 20th century is now about to open, showing no truly enlightened nation upon the face of the earth. So contrary to the sort of feelings of the time that there was progress, that things were getting better and better, she was very clear that no, they weren't for women. And one of the things she identifies, um, if we can have the, the next one, um, Sue was going to do this bit, so I will not be doing it as um, possibly as well as her, but she quotes a list um, of rules for the government of my wife's conduct from 1879 um, from a Mr. Davenport. Um, and I think that the rules, there was a divorce case um, and the, these rules had been um, shared in this, which is why she had it. And so it gives a whole list of things that he's, she cannot do um, while she's, she seems to be going on a, on a trip. Um, to, to family in, in New York um, you know she's not allowed to speak to anybody she's got to go to a certain place and be only there and you know keep away from people I mean I've just sort of copied the first three um, it, there were seven rules in total and it all says you can't go here you can't speak to anybody the only people you can see is your brother I think it was um, and it's it, what she's identified is very clearly coercive control uh you know she, again she doesn't name it as that it wasn't um sort of conceptualized as that and sue was going to read out some rules from um a book that was was published this century um that had a you know where a man had a you know a set of rules for his wife that she had to obey starting with you know vacuuming the living room daily and again it go you know went on to what she could how she could spend her time where she could go that sort of thing um so she's very clear that marriage is not good for women. Um, it's it's not beneficial to her, to us. 
Um, and the, the increase of rights in the 19th century is an illusion. You know, although there have been some changes in law in the laws in America for things like property, um, it, it, it had made very, very little difference. And she actually um, gives some examples of the, the cruel treatment of, of women, um, certainly around the fact that um, assaults by a husband on a wife were you not taken seriously. Um, so she gives an example of lenient sentences uh, that a man accused of injuring his, his wife was given a one pound fine. Uh, at the same court on the same day, a man accused of damaging a bench was fined two pounds. So, you know, a woman is worth half of a bench. Um, and it you know, then goes on to some of the stuff that I won't go into in detail about how, you know, women didn't even have like, any control over their children. They could lose custody. They didn't have any sort of say in how they would be educated or named or anything like that, that women had no right to question their husbands, um, you know, that he had, could have total control over her property, but she had no right to question um what he did or, or how he spent his money um it, you know she gave an example from a court case where a woman had tried to challenge the fact that her husband was spending all the the money that was supposed to be for the family on fancy dinners out and going you know you know all the best um clothes to wear and everything like that um just frittering it away essentially leaving her with not enough to maintain the house and the children. And basically the judge who was trying to get a divorce said, well, that's just the way it is. You, you know, it's his money, he can do what he, he likes with it. And your job as a wife is just to make the best of what he allows you to have. Um, so it was you know, still very, very much um, women powerless, women um, just completely under, the, the the control of a, a woman. She even gives um, examples of women that had left husbands, um, you know, that had, had moved away, trying to start a new life, and they were actually forced to return. Um, the, the court said, "No, you don't have any right to go and leave. This, you know, whatever he's done to you isn't isn't sufficient. He's not, you know, there were some rights to divorce and separation on grounds of cruelty, but the the you know, level of cruelty you had to prove was was very high, and you know, violence wasn't necessarily um, grounds for it. Those restrictive rules that I mentioned weren't enough of a ground for it. Not giving, you know, depriving you of money wasn't enough grounds for it. So she is very anti-marriage; doesn't see it as any kind of advantage for women. And then she goes on to talk about women's um, work, uh, both paid work and domestic labour. All right. I can slow down, I think. I've, I've just had a look at the time and we've still got quite a lot of time. So, so sorry if I've been speaking too quickly. I think that's something that I tend to, to do. I worry about the time. So um, if we could go on to the, the next slide and then we'll be talking about women and work. Um, so one of the... Um, talents of 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 um gage is that she her her skill is to study the bible and know the bible better than the men and so when they say oh you know the bible justifies this treatment of women or the bible says that this has to happen she challenges this by better knowledge of the bible she she turns it back on them um, and knows it better than they do. And one of the fundamental justifications um, that the, the Bible gave for the oppression of women was what was known as the curse of Eve. Um, so I don't know, you know, I'll just go through it for you know, women that aren't, aren't familiar with the, the Bible, but um, in the Garden of Eden, there, were, there was, you know, Adam and Eve, and they were told that they shouldn't eat the fruit of a particular tree, the, the, the knowledge of good and evil, I think it was called. Um, 
Eve was tempted by a serpent and disobeyed and she ate the apple and shared it with Adam. And for that, uh, Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden and they were both cursed. The curse of Eve was to be subject to Adam, that she had to um, obey him, and also that she would bear children in pain and suffering. So the, the, the idea that, um, you know, childbirth was painful was God's punishment. And that, that was often, you know, this was used to remind women of their inferior status and responsibility for all the sin in the world. Um, but she, she reminds her readers that Adam was also cursed. And that is obviously, you know, forgotten about. And his curse was to do all the work of the world, to, to lay, you know, his, his labour was to labour in the, in the fields. And so she says, if you're going to take the Bible literally, women should actually be exempt from any work except childbearing. Um, because Adam is meant to do the work, Eve bears the children. Um, and the, one of the things the church um, used this curse of Eve um, to justify was opposition to any use of anaesthetics to relieve any you know, women's pain in labour. Um, you know, because this was the time when anaesthetics um, were starting to be developed and the church was, was condemning this as, you know, interfering with God's God's punishment, um, you know, that, that women had to be subject to their husbands, um, desire them and labour in pain. She says, logically, if, they're, if they wanted to be against any alleviation of women's curse, then it should surely protest any attempts to relieve men's labour, but the idle rich are respected more than labourers. And in fact, of course, men work, men make women work incredibly hard in agriculture and industry, as well as domestic work, but they don't get the benefit of it. And the church doesn't object to this. Um, the only time there's any objection to women working is when they want to encroach on the male monopolies of high paid and professional work. So, She's clear that men, with the backing of the church, use and exploit women in our labour to enrich themselves. And she actually describes it as a universally extended form of domestic slavery. And then she gives an incredible amount of evidence of the nature of women's oppression through work um, in countries around the world. She doesn't just concentrate on, on the uh, UK and the USA. Um, you know, there's, she gives examples from Russia, from Switzerland, Sweden, Belgium. She's done an incredibly, um, uh, you know, amount of, of research. And one of the things that we wanted to share was was this, which is the um, testimony of um, women workers. And she's taken this from a report that was done in, in Britain um, about women that were working in the um, coal mines in the north of England. Um, and the, the hardship that they went and I mean, they were literally chained to um, sort of small wagons and pulled these from the coal face up to the surface, um, you know, going on their hands and feet with a, a chain around their, you know, between their legs, um, a, a steep road, uh, very wet. The water comes over our clog tops. Um, yeah, a 17 year old having a bald patch on her head because of having to use her, her head to, to do things. And, you know, it just gives an example of how badly women are treated. And she contrasts this with Christianity's claim to protect women and respect women and that, you know, women had a, a special place. It's very much she realizes that only applies to middle class women, that working class women are just, you know, used. Um, for their labour. Um, I mean, she gives other examples um, of rural women as well. I mean, she she doesn't just look at the, um, you know, industrial um, work, but rural women do incredibly hard and heavy labour. Again, they have to carry heavy loads. They can be harnessed to carts. They dig, they heart this they're treated a beast and burden, a beast of burden. And of course, she points out that unlike men, they also have to do the domestic work. So although men may work hard, they might get some rest at the end of the day. The woman doesn't because she has to make sure he has his food and she has to attend to the children, uh, do the laundry, all, all the things we know. Um, and, you know, 
this has become a custom for women to do all that and then that becomes a, an unwritten law or even a moral command so women are just expected to do all this without any complaint and, and, and she goes back to saying if Adam's curse to labour was taken seriously this should be men's work women are cursed to bring children into the world in sorrow there is nothing said about rearing them and she's very clear that um, women that do work are not paid enough to survive. And she makes the link to women ending up um, in prostitution, um, that they can't actually can't make enough uh, money to support themselves by the wages they're allowed. She's very clear that male workers in trade unions will act against the interests of women workers. They will preserve their own um, rights and privileges. And this even goes to such petty things um, as denying armrests to pottery painters. So it wasn't just keeping women's wages low or excluding them from the um, trades that uh, you know, were more skilled and highly paid. You know, they couldn't even have a rest or they ex managed to exclude women from um, cheaper workers' fairs that were offered on, on some trams. So women's wages were never enough to live on to live on so they were forced to be dependent on husbands and families most of them had no choice but to you know to stay with a, a man however bad things were um and many male employers sexually abused their workers um and older women in particular she said found it almost impossible to secure any form of employment being forced into the workhouse workhouse at best and slow starvation or suicide at the worst and so she's clear that this is because men are seen as owning the labour and services of their wives and daughters. And this is backed up by the church and the state. A husband could take any money that his wife earned and she was obliged to do the domestic labour without payment. But she had no claim on any of his resources. She was very much dependent on what he what he chose to give her. But she just contrasts the heavy labour of the modern American woman with the life of the Native American women. Um, as I said at the beginning, she was, she was familiar um, with the, the um, nations that were sort of in the area of New York that she lived in. And she said that the women there were, were much better off. They didn't have to work as hard. They had more power. Um, you know, there was a council of women that had some decision making power. So how are we doing? So if we go on to the next slide she then sort of goes on to what the church is doing against women um in the 19th century she, although she does a lot of historical work she doesn't want it to be seen as though things have, have changed or have got better um she she accuses them as as much as anybody else And one of the things she suggests is that women are not sufficiently aware of the meaning of personal liberty or the causes of their restricted condition. And they're constrained by customs, laws and morality. And they lack property or education. And both are a source of power. So that's definitely one of her sort of um, things that she sees as needing to happen is that women become educated, um, that they abandon um, self-sacrifice, which has been what women have been expected to do for self-development, um, you know, for sort of understanding their own capabilities, their own, their own capacity, their, their own, um, oh, I can't know, <laughs> sorry. Um, and then so one of the things she is very critical of her contemporary church for is being against education for women. Um, you know, at this time, women weren't allowed into universities, um, they weren't allowed to study things like medicine or law. Um, and the church was, you know, against that. In, in, so a medical opinion, they would say that, you know, women's, you know, women's brains couldn't cope with it or, or it would damage their reproductive organs if they had to think too much. And of course, since women are only there to have children, that was a, a, a bad thing. So she's got, um, you know, the, the in deprecating education for women, no organised body in the world has so clearly proven its own tyrannous ignorance as had the priesthood. 
and no body has shown itself so fully the enemy of mankind. And she says that this, you know, restriction of education, the, um, you know, destruction of the knowledge um, of the so-called witches, um, have actually physically damaged women, as well as, um, you know, mentally, subjugated her spirit and crushed her belief in her right to herself and the proper training of her children. So she sees it as, you know, the whole patriarchal system um, of men's institutions acting for and behalf of men um, as just a bit utterly and totally damaging um, to, to women. And I like, I like this one as well. The church and its opposition to women's education through the ages has literally killed off the inhabitants of the world with much greater rapidity than war, pestilence or famine. More than one half of the children born into the world have soon died because of the tyranny and ignorance of the priesthood. Because, of course, at that time, there was a tremendous um, uh, infant mortality rate. Many women, many children um, didn't survive, um, you know, beyond the first sort of months or, or years of, of life. And that is because of the priests, because they damaged knowledge they denied women education so they didn't you know they weren't able even to to sort of, you know keep their children um well so, so where are we now i'm just checking on thing like this in. um so we have her conclusions, some of the things on the, the um, final slide that we've got here. Her, her final chapter is called Past, Present and Future. Um, and she has some lovely um, sort of summering up. The most stupendous system of organised robbery known has been that of the church towards women. A robbery that has not only taken her self-respect, but all rights of person. The fruits of her own industry, her opportunities of education, the exercise of her own judgment, her own conscience, uh, her own will. So she, you know, she's very clear um, of the damage that the, the church and then all the other institutions. I mean, she very much concentrates on the church, which was still powerful at that time. But that's why it's called woman, church and state, that the state laws just still reflect this, this view of women. And so... Are her conclusions useful to us today? I would say yes. I've I've learned a lot from reading this this book. It's you know th there's an excellent analysis of how men um, control institutions. They're run by men for men and are used to oppress women. It's a, it's a good radical feminist um, framework because she realizes that there's needs for fundamental change, not just some laws for equal rights. Um, you know, the, the sort of society as it is currently structured is actively organising against women. And that's not just all she concentrates on church and all on state. She also then takes that into the uh, the private realm of marriage and the family, that the those institutions have been set up in such a way that it oppresses um, women. And actually challenging marriage and religion in this way at the time <coughs> was very radical. You know, as I said at the beginning, it, it was too much for, for some, um, you know, more conservative feminists. Um, and that's why she was pushed out and, and forgotten. Um, so, she, you know, we need fundamental change, not just some laws for equal rights. Um, women are not recognised as fully human. And again, she, she emphasises the importance of women's personal develop, development and free thought because one of the things that obviously the church did was to say, this is the truth. We have the truth. You know, nobody can think, you know, anything else is heresy. We'll, we'll, wipe, we'll wipe it out. She, you know, she says women need to stop being the scapegoat of humanity. Reject the idea that we're inferior in need of protection in favour of freedom and to seek educational and political rights. And she says, but woman is learning for herself, that not self-sacrifice, but self-development is her first duty in life. Um, and her final words, um, which I've put on here, the second part of this quote is, 
During the ages, no rebellion has been of like importance with that of woman against the tyranny of church and state. None has had its far-reaching effects. We note its beginning. Its progress will overthrow every existing form of these institutions. Its end will be a, re a regenerated world. So I just made me think, if only she had been listened to, if only this had been a sort of handbook for, for women um, over the last 100 years, we may have made uh, a bit more progress than we have done. But it's certainly, I found it a very inspiring book and very fascinating in terms of what it uh, and what it covers. So, um, yeah, it is actually available freely online if you if you search. I meant to, to post the link, but um, so I ended up doing it on my own. I forgot to do that. Um, but if you if you Google um, Women, Church and State, Matilda Jocelyn Engage, you will you will find it online and you can download it. So. That is the um, end of the so, presentation, and now I'm going to yes. hand you over to Jo. I'm, I'm going to join in now because you're yeah, coughing. Thank you. I I can, um, and I should look the, at the chat and any... Um, yeah. And I'm also going to see if possibly uh, Sheila Jeffries or Marion Rittigliano, who have both been here in the background, would like to come in in a few words. Maybe just open your videos and I'll, um, I'll pin you and get you to come on. Yeah, great. That would that would be um that would be really good. So I'm adding Sheila Jeffries as a spotlight and Marianne. And if you both unmute yourselves, then um we could we could perhaps have we've got about 10 minutes or eight minutes left. Let's see. So Sheila, have you got any thoughts on the on the book? Yes. Um I didn't know about the book though. I was just trying to look up when it was first published. When was your copy published, Dorothea? I, I don't know because I've got the on I got an online I, I 1893 it was on my no, no, I mean slide. republished I guess I mean republished in second wave feminism right I don't know because I didn't yeah, get, I, I couldn't find a, a physical copy at yeah, least I think advice, so. I've just been looking up because I think in the 70s when I first became a feminist I didn't know about this book and it probably was not until it was republished uh, because Basically, she's talking about all the things we talked about in second wave feminism. So, I mean, extraordinary stuff. As I said in the chat, absolutely extraordinary that women still take slave names when they marry. I mean, and women are slaves. I mean, marriage is obviously about slavery, as she points out, and feminists did in the second wave. And also, of course, as I pointed out in Spinster and Her Enemies, there were women a bit like her in the UK. Uh, there was... Uh, Cicely Hamilton, who was a spinster and wrote Marriage as a Trade in the first decade of the 20th century, who makes many of these uh, points and says it's just unpaid labour and so on. And there was Winifred um, Walstenholm uh, Elmy, who uh, at the end of the 19th century in Britain was refusing to marry her, the man that she was then forced to marry because she was in the anti-prostitution campaign and it, they wouldn't accept her unless she married, and she was very critical of marriage as well. So I think what second wave feminists didn't know in the beginning, and many people don't know now, is that there was a massive campaign by spinsters and against marriage and to criticize religion and to criticize marriage at that time. It was common, but obviously, as you pointed out, Matilda was to the extreme of this and was not acceptable because of that. But there were women in Britain who were just as critical. Um, and so, yeah, it's a it's an absolutely terrific book. And the way, as you say, that we just get disappeared from history regularly over and over and over again is awful, really, because it's all the same themes all the way through. Really, really is. Marriages still exist. I mean, marriage not only exists, but there are lesbians doing it and talking about having wives. I mean, incredible, you know, 130 years on, and there are people who still don't realize marriage is a form of slavery in which men possess women. I mean, that's incredible, really. Even some women who call themselves feminists, absolutely incredible. Anyway, I'll leave it there. How about, how about you, Marion? What did you get from it? Um, so, I mean, it was brilliant. But, yeah. I'm glad you did this. This is kind of a, a follow-up on a book we did a couple of weeks ago called Sisters in Spirit about um, Matilda Jocelyn Gage and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1848, um, middle of nowhere, upstate New York. Um, and the first, you know, 
women's convention. Um, and, it, and it's by the same author, Sally Roche Wagner. And she talked about and quoted um, these early writings, even then from Matilda Jocelyn Gage, about the effect on religion of, of women. Um, and it's all religions. It's the, it's the three Abrahamic religions, and we could debate which one's worse and which one's most worse by women, but it's all cut from the same cloth. And it's not just the Abrahamic religions. You can go to um, supposedly enlightened religions anywhere in the world, um, and there's pretty significant misogyny and, you know, concomitantly homophobia, lesbophobia. Um, but I, I think what's really telling is that is that when women first started thinking, you know, back in 1848 or even before that, when women first started thinking, at least in the U.S., about why women are in the position we're in and how we are oppressed, one of the first things that one of the best thinkers came up with is that religion um, plays a huge role in in uh, the oppression of women. Um, and she, uh, I remember quotes from uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage from that other book, um, talking about um, how, um, uh, you know, patriarchy couldn't exist without religion and religion couldn't exist without patriarchy because they are the same thing. And religions, especially the ones that that um, have men being subservient um, rather than in a loving relationship with a God, um, this is really damaging to like, you know, male ego and male socialization. So the way they cope with it is by then being oppressive to you know, some lesser form of life, which is always women. Um, so this is, this is even before, um, you know, uh, 18, what was it, 83, 73, um, back in 1848, Matilda Jocelyn Gage knew, she knew, she was, um, she was one of the first. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll add uh, also a thing that really upsets me is that, um, when uh, academics today teach feminism, they, uh, certainly to schools, but also I think at university level, the standard understanding is that the suffragettes were middle-class white women who were uh, only interested in the vote in a simplistic way, thinking that the vote was, and, and in their own liberation and that they didn't have any conception of anything else and they were racist. That's how they're taught. And then they say the second wave added on uh, some of the you know, radical feminist ideas about sexuality and then the, the brilliance of the postmodernist intersectional 1990s where they, they actually sort of chastised the bad women that all came before for being racist and right wing and middle class and it's just such nonsense and I think this this is wonderful that you've um dispelled all of that um in this you know bringing uh Jocelyn Gage uh uh Matilda Jocelyn Gage back into our consciousness and hopefully lots of us will read it I'm certainly going to read it now Well, we've got two minutes left, so <laughs> yeah. maybe back to you, Dorothea. <laughs> yeah, well, just to say, yeah, I mean, and thank you. I've been, I, I've enjoyed reading it. I'm having a quick look at the um, the the chat, and it you know, seems to have got lots of uh, ideas um, going. So, yeah, I just thank you, everybody, for coming and listening. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, there are some breakout rooms if you want to go next week. We have Sonia Johnson. Is it what, what's the name of it, Marion? Fire. Wildfire. Wildfire. Um, Wildfire. Uh, by Sonia Johnson, discussed by Marion Ritigliano. So thanks so much this week to everybody and especially Dorothea. Okay. Thank you. Bye.